Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service, the Unitarian Universal Church of Augusta for March 7th. Our speaker this morning is Reverend Don Cameron. The sermon is titled, No Greater Love, The Witness of James Reed. David? Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day, a little chilly out there, but I'm glad the sun is back. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 121, We'll Build the Land. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2, and I have a big smile on my face when I tell you that we are being led by our uh, family minister, youth minister, Reverend Kim Miner. Thank you, David. Our announcements this morning will be by our board member, Marcia Frank. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our visitors. Our, our visitors are invited to coffee with the minister, which is after church today at noon, and that's done by a Zoom, and uh, a link will be in the chat for that if you would like to join, join us. The uh, UUC parents group will meet today after the service at noon. The Zoom link will be in the e-announcements. There will be a parents happy hour on Friday, March 12th from 8.30 until they get tired of talking online. And it's for parents to socialize with each other and enjoy some adult time after the kids go to bed. Contact Kim Miner for information. And a reminder that Sunday RE classes for school age kids, um, K through fifth grade have resumed and they're meeting from 10, 10 to 1050 and they're doing this on Zoom. The classes will be led by Lynn Bonner with help from Kim Miner and the Zoom link and other information are, is in the e-announcements. The UU Monday meditation group gathering will meet online and face-to-face -face in the sanctuary in a hybrid meeting on Monday evenings from 7 to 8.30. Contact E. McNabb or Melanie Roberts for information. Individuals who are interested in meeting in person in the church on Monday should get in touch with Chris Garcia, who is our worship associate today, and let him know as soon as possible if you'd like to attend. The Wednesday evening exploration group will meet at 7 p.m. via Zoom on Wednesday, it's on Wednesdays, and they are discussing Grandma Gatewood's Walk, the inspiring story of a, the woman who saved the Appalachian Trail by Ben Montgomery. And you can contact Jan Parsons for the link. 
our UU Goddess Group will meet on Thursday, March 11th to celebrate the spring equinox as a hybrid meeting, which means it's going to be both online and in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Contact Jezebel Annette for information. And we have an extra announcement for today. Um, and this is for this evening. Our new Reverend, Reverend Nick Filson, will be our new minister starting on August 1st. He is being ordained today as a UU minister, and he's personally inviting UU members and friends to attend. The link to the 5 p.m. Zoom event will be in your chat. And all you need to do is copy and save the link from the chat if you would like to watch our new Reverend being ordained today. Our church remains in phase three of its reopening guidelines and they're posted on our Facebook page and it allows groups of less than 15 to meet at the church in appropriate rooms under our reopening guidelines. Let your board liaison or the church administrator know if you would like to meet at the church. The seating in the sanctuary has been arranged to ensure six feet of distance between individuals and some seating is arranged to allow for couples from the same household to sit together. Please don't move the chairs from their current positions if you're attending a scheduled event. Thank you very much and back to you, Chris. Thank you, Marcia. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from Jesus of Nazareth from the book of John. No greater love, no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Our joys and sorrows this morning will be read by our pastoral care team member, Chris Palmer. Chris? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am glad to be here, and this is our. Oh, no, I have to unmute. Take a deep breath. Sit back in your seat. These are the words of Denise Levertov. In awe so quiet, I don't know where it began. A gratitude had begun to sing in me. Was there some moment dividing song from no song? When does dewfall begin? When does night fold its arms over our hearts to cherish them? When is daybreak? Our reader for Women's History Month will be Elizabeth McNabb. E? Good morning, everybody. Um, the reading that I am hopefully sending to you a link for on the chat is from Writings of a Furious Woman by Camille Rainville with a little judicious cutting so that it's not too long. Be a lady, they said. Your skirt is too short. Your pants are too tight. Don't show so much skin. Don't show your midriff. Don't show your cleavage. Cover up. Leave something to the imagination. Dress modestly. Don't be a temptress. Men can't control themselves. Men have needs. But don't look frumpy. Loosen up. Show some skin. Look sexy. Look hot. Don't be so provocative. You're asking for it. Wear black heels. I mean, wear black, wear heels. You're too dressed up. 
you're too dressed down. Don't wear sweatpants. You look like you've let yourself go. Be a lady, they said. Don't be too fat. Don't be too thin. Don't be too large. Don't be too small. Eat up. Slim down. Stop eating so much. Don't eat too fast. Order a salad. Don't eat carbs. Skip dessert. You need to lose weight. Fit into that dress. Go on a diet. Watch what you eat. Chew gum. Eat celery. Drink lots of water. You have to fit into those jeans. God, you look like a skeleton. Why don't you just eat? You look emaciated. You look sick. Eat a burger. Men like women with some meat on their bones. Be a lady, they said. Remove your body hair. Bleach this. Bleach that. Lighten your skin. Tan your skin. Eradicate your scars. Cover your stretch marks. Tighten your abs. Plump your lips. Botox your wrinkles. Lift your face. Tuck your tummy. Thin your thighs. Tone your calves. Perk up your boobs. But look natural. Be yourself. Be genuine. Be confident. You're trying too hard. You look overdone. Men don't like girls who try too hard. Be a lady, they said. Wear makeup. Lengthen your lashes. Color your lips. Your hair is too short. Your hair is too long. Highlight your hair. Your roots are showing. Dye your hair. You're going gray. You look old. Look youthful. Look ageless. Don't get old. Old is ugly. Men don't like ugly. Be a lady, they said. Save yourself. Be pure. Be virginal. Don't talk about sex. Be innocent. Don't flirt. Don't be a skank. Don't be a whore. Don't sleep around. Don't lose your dignity. Don't give yourself away. Men don't like sluts. But don't be a prude. Don't be so uptight. Have a little fun. Smile more. Be experienced. Be virginal. Be sexy. Be the cool girl. Don't be like the other girls. Be a lady, they said. Don't talk too loud. Don't talk too much. Don't take up space. Don't sit like that. Don't stand like that. Don't be intimidating. But smile. Don't be a bitch. Don't be so bossy. Don't be assertive. Don't overreact. Don't be so emotional. Don't cry. Don't yell. Don't swear. Be passive. Be obedient. Be pleasing. Don't complain. Let him down easy. Boost his ego. Make him fall for you. Men want what they can't have. Don't give yourself away. Make him work for it. Be a lady, they said. Don't get raped. Protect yourself. Don't drink too much. Don't walk alone. Don't go out too late. Don't dress like that. Don't get drunk. Don't leave your drink. Have a buddy. Walk where it's well lit. Stay in safe neighborhoods. Tell someone where you're going. Bring pepper spray. Buy a rape whistle. Hold your keys like a weapon. Take a self-defense course. Check your trunk. Lock your doors. Don't go alone. Don't make eye contact. Don't bat your eyelashes. Don't look easy. Don't attract attention. Don't work late. Don't crack dirty jokes. Don't smile at strangers. Don't go out at night. Don't trust anyone. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Just be a lady, they said. Thank you, E. <laughs> Our offering words this morning are the courage of the early morning's dawning and the strength of the central hills and the peace of the evening's ending and the love of God in our hearts. Our offering will now be taken online.
I'd like to begin the sermon <clears throat> with a reading, and it's from James Reeve, September 1962. There are questions in the hearts and minds of people as to whether there are inequities, or if there are, whether they are not deserved. And our answer, it seems to me, must be persistently strong, that life is full of inequities and that it is our job to bring them to an end. For those who have been deprived, for those who have suffered from inequities, we cannot always expect the drive to correct them. Inequities create emotional damage in all of us. But I do believe that those who suffer from the inequity of surplus goods of life have a responsibility that has been placed on the shoulders of no other group of people. If we have received enough care and love, if we have been beneficiaries of consideration and kindness and find these things in our own hearts, we're the ones that can bring them to those who have been oppressed. The church should be a fellowship of people who can help repair the damages that occur due to the inequities of life. I say we who have received a surplus of goods of life have this responsibility. But I think we must all be surprised from time to time with those who have suffered from the greatest inequities, bring forth a faith and an energy into life for which one can find no reasonable explanation. Helen Keller said, however dark the world may seem, we have the light of faith at our command and it is ours to do with as we will. For faith is thought directed toward good, and like all thought, it is infinite power. Faith is a brave look at the soul for new paths to life. It is not dogma. It is a white fire of enthusiasm. In its higher forms, faith is the kindler of all nobility. What we call security is mostly superstition. It does not exist anywhere in nature nor do the children of humanity as a whole experience it. Life is either a daring adventure or it is nothing. To keep our faces towards change and behave like free spirits in the presence of faith is strength undefeatable. Amen. In 1965, James Reed, Presbyterian minister turned Unitarian joined the ministerial staff at All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. He soon became radicalized by the poverty surrounding the church. And for some of you, I should add that All Souls is a Unitarian Universalist church. But he soon became radicalized by the poverty surrounding the church. Reeve decided to devote his life to social service on behalf of the poor. Consequently, he and his family moved to Boston. There he worked first in an open ministry and then with the Quakers to facilitate the development of low cost housing. By 1965, Reeb's growing commitment to an involvement in the civil rights movement impelled him to answer Dr. King's call to join marchers in Selma, Alabama. To be honest, our Unitarian Universalist pulpits emptied with King's call. There at dusk, one evening, while leaving a restaurant in a black neighborhood in the company of two other Unitarian Universalist ministers, Orloff Miller and Clark Olson, Reeb and his companions were accosted by four white men wielding baseball bats. Miller and Olson were beaten but survived. James Reeb was murdered. In his first sermon to the Congregation of All Souls, Reeb asked, is there nothing worth risking one's life for? Are there no dreams or goals so important that we risk our own destruction to gain them? He answered those questions with his life. If we are to truly grasp what James Reed was about in his last years of his life, we must first understand the rethinking that was taking place in the early 1960s concerning the church's mission. 
This rethinking was inspired by Protestant theologians such as Barth, Tillich, and Bonhoeffer. What were the concerns of this new theology? What terms did it reject? And which ones did it affirm? The new theology rejected the new theology rejected the prevailing model, which assumed God acts through the church to save the world. Or if one is humanistically inclined, the assumption that the church lives out its ideals by putting them to work in the outside world. In either case, the new theology rejected any notion that the church is the sacred center out of which people go to save the world, to do justice. What the new theology did affirm was a radical, this worldly model of religious understanding that began with the world and not with the church. Thus, the church's mission and purpose is outside its own doors. This model came to be known as the larger ministry of the church. By adopting the new theology, Reed could not help but be impatient with what he perceived as the pride of the institutional church. With Paul Tillich, he believed that the first word religion must speak is a word against religion, against the self-satisfied notion that a church exists as an end in itself, that its only purpose is to serve the spiritual needs of its members, or that it bears within itself the means of human redemption. He could not believe that the church was justified in devoting its resources to bigger buildings and programs when the earth was groaning outside its doors, laboring to bring forth a more just social order. In his view, the contemporary church was in danger of becoming secularized in the worst sense. It was adopting the very values of consumerism and corporate growth that were crushing the earth and our people. Much of the impetus for Reeves theology came from the field of biblical studies. <clears throat> Emerging among scholars was the view that the sacred story of the Bible, the God savings act in history is the public story. It does not take place in temples or churches or mosques, but in the world, in Egypt, in the desert, on mountaintops, in battles and palaces, on hills and in towns bordering the Sea of Galilee. In the streets of Jerusalem, it takes place in the midst of public conflict, struggle, and suffering. The new theology and its advocacy of church renewal now had solid biblical grounding. It is this public story that the church is called to celebrate in its liturgy and to serve the world. This is the mission of the church, to witness the prophetic events taking place now in the public realm. James Reed agreed with all this. This was the reason why when he met his old friends, Bill Wendt and Gina Barani in Selma, he said to them, I knew you would be here. Reeves, Protestant, and Catholic friends were always looking for ways to see current events as reenactments of the biblical past. While Reed believed that a new story was being enacted in public life, this new story had a distinct plot and a set of principles. In other words, Reeves affirmed the sacred story at the center of his own faith, the faith of a Unitarian Universalist. That sacred story is the democratic story. The story of ordinary women and men struggling to create a common life in which all might meet in mutual respect and sit together at the common table. In fact, in 1949, our own A. Pal Davies wrote a book entitled America's Real Religion. In that book, he proposed and argued that democracy is the real religion of our, our country. Our Unitarian Universalist heritage tells us we are a faith of deeds, not creeds. The second source of our faith says, words and deeds of prophetic 
women and men, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. We can be proud of many of our Unitarian Universalist forebears who did precisely that. But what about us? What are the larger ministries of this church? As James Reed could have told us, morality and moralism are very different things. In fact, they run at cross purposes. My late colleague, Forrester Church, tells the rest. Moral posturing gives us a sense of accomplishment without our having actually done anything. In short, we feel that we have washed our hands every time we wring them. It's like a mock purification ceremony in which gives only the appearance of cleansing. Take our response to the religious right. It does not really matter what we may think of the politics or the religion of our fundamentalist neighbors. All that matters is whether we're willing to live up to the promise and power of our own faith. Morality not proved in deeds is always betrayed by words, however right-minded, lofty, and sage. I call this sin. Though far from exclusive to Unitarian Universalists, the principal sin besetting many of us today is the sin of sophisticated resignation. This sin is particularly insidious because it comes with its own veil. That is, it appears respectable. It allows us to feel strongly about injustices without prompting us to do anything about them. The sin is tailor-made for many of us because it is fed by knowledge. We know so much about the world's problems and their enormity that however much we want to do something about them, we feel impotent. What could we do to affect hunger, homelessness, AIDS, or the threat of nuclear annihilation? How much easier it is to watch our diets and tone our bodies. For many of us, self-improvement, both physical and spiritual, has displaced the transformation of society is our principal moral concern. End of quote. Our heritage has been one that has protested any notion that the church exists as an end in itself. In light of this heritage, the meaning of the larger ministry is this. Since the liberal church, no less any other church, is perpetually tempted to forget its own gospel, to lose the thread of plot of the story it is called to serve, it is the task of the larger ministry to point the way. By word, yes, but most of all, by actual participation in the drama of redemption now being played out in the world. And what is that story? James Reed encapsulated it in the prayer he gave the Sunday in 1964, that this was the Sunday that he took leave of All Souls Church for Boston. That all who live in freedom won by sacrifice of others be untiring in the task begun until every man and woman on earth is free. Back to that fateful night in Selma, Alabama. When the attack was over, it was clear that Jim's, Jim Reed was seriously hurt. Miller and Olson found the phone in an insurance office. They obtained an ambulance from a black funeral home next door. The driver was black. The, I'm going to go off a little bit off the screen because the, the driver was black and uh, they would not, the, uh, the Selma police would only escort them to the line. And once they got past the line, they were surrounded and had a flat tire and they locked the doors and just drove back, destroying the rim and got another ambulance. So that's the full story of what happened. And he's having brain injuries. This is not good. But finally, Reed arrived at the Birmingham Hospital, where he immediately went, underwent surgery. And the reason they went to Birmingham, because it was the closest neosurgeon, brain surgeon, 
to Selma. Well, news traveled quickly. In sharp contrast to the media silence which greeted Jimmy Lee Jackson's death just two weeks earlier, the press announced nationwide that a white Unitarian Universalist minister had been badly beaten in Selma. President Lyndon Johnson sent a government airplane to take Marie to her husband's side. In James Reeves hospital room, there was a bouquet of yellow roses from the president. On March 11th, two days after his arrival in Selma, James Reeve died. Thursday, this Thursday, marks the 56th anniversary of his death. His death so shocked the country and the U.S. Congress that President Johnson sent the Voting Rights Act to Congress within days. Dr. King, invited to Washington to support the Voting Rights Act, declined. Instead, <clears throat> he delivered the eulogy at Reeves' funeral. I leave you with some of his words that day. So in his death, James Reeves says something to each of us, black and white alike, says that we must substitute courage for caution, says to us that we must be concerned not merely about who murdered him, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy that produced the murder. His death says to us that we must work passionately, unrelentingly, to make the American dream a reality. So he did not die in vain. Amen, Martin. Blessed be. David. Thank you, Reverend Don. Before we get to our closing hymn, I should say it's History Month. Our music that you heard at Offertory was by... Uh, an important American composer uh, around the turn of the uh, 20th century. Her first symphony was premiered by the Boston Symphony in 1896, and we heard uh, the opening segment of her piano piece entitled Dreams. And now our closing hymn is number hymn 1026. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 3, and we are led by Patricia Childs.
Our closing words uh, from my colleague, Mark Morrison Reed. Uh, Mark was, is black, I think he's retired now, but one of the uh, early black ministers in our denomination. This reading's in our hymnal. The title is The Task of the Religious Community. The central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. It is the church that assures us that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. The religious community is essential. For alone, our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. Oh, 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 oh,